everybody ready? Okay, so we're going to review from last week. So just real quick, we'll go through and review these. On the first day, it was light. From who? Get back here to God. God. In Genesis, yes, we're still saying from Genesis. So on day one, there was light. Day two was the sky. Day three was the land and vegetation. And we discussed this. We'll soon. We'll discuss that soon too. Day four was the sun, the moon, and the stars. Day five was the birds and the sea creatures. And day six was the land animals and man. And that's what we discussed. It was really, really enjoyed that, right? So it's very obvious that we know that these things mean that there's 24 hours in each day. It's a true 24 hours period. And some people believe that 1,000 you know, years in a day, but no, it is a true 24 hours. We know that. Scientists are right. They say that the earth is round and it's 24 hours because of the way that it spins and rotates. A day and a night is 24 hours. Yes. Okay. So, and the Bible matches. The scriptures say, remember, the Bible is the final authority. Not following everything that the scientists say. No, because scientists sometimes are wrong and they twist and they turn things. Just like ever since they said, you know, the scientists said the Bible in school and a long time ago, you know, things were wrong. People thought a long time ago that it was less than, that there was less than nine planets without only five. Okay. There's more than ten. No. 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 verses until all the way up down to 31, verse 31. We discussed it. It says, Then God looked over all he had made, and he saw that it was very, very good. And then evening passed, and morning came, marking the sixth day. That's what we discussed and finished with last week. So now, we're going to the next chapter, Genesis chapter 2. So some of you think, you know, if we're going too fast, you know, the Bible stories, you know, move along really fast, and sometimes they do. You go through, and it really takes many, many, many years until we're going to go again. It's longer. Oh, okay. It's not going to like, it's going to go fast. Sorry. So, the creation of the heavens the earth and everything in them was completed. Completed. So on the seventh day, God had finished his work of the creation. He's finished. So he rested from all of his work. And God blessed the seventh day and he declared it holy. Because it was the day when he had rested from all of his work of creation. So I have a question for you. This is related to the Sabbath. This is how we sign Sabbath. So we discussed the Sabbath. That's a really hot topic. And why? Because there's you know many out there that say, oh no, you have to worship on the seventh day. You must worship on Sunday. That's wrong. You have to follow, you know, God's law. You must follow that. And that's some discussion, but we will discuss that tonight. We will. It's a very hot topic. But the point is now that God was resting from his work, work of creation. He rested. And what that means, what does that mean when you say that God rested? Was God tired? Was he tired of working? 
like, whoo, exhausted. Now think that God wants us to stop and look at all of the good work, you know, that he, that's what he wants, you know, just to, to look at the earth and see how good it is and rest. <laughs> almost, you know, like it applies to us today. Like, you know, we work hard and we do all the time, but no, we need to slow down, we need to stop, and just sit back and look and rest. That's good. And the point of this question is that God rested, and that means what? Did he rest from exhaustion? She said no, and a lot of you say no, so what does that mean that he rested? Does he need rest? What does that mean? It just means that he stopped. He worked, and then he stopped. So on that day, God means that he rested. He worship? Yes, but the point is that God himself was resting. He wasn't tired. No, God himself was satisfied with his work that he had finished, and so he stopped. He stopped working. That's all. That's all that means. You just he stopped working. I think maybe is also an example of um, for man that we need to you know work for for six six days and that he knew we would need to rest, so he gave us a day for rest. Yes. And uh, <laughs> you think, well, that's what that's right. We're going to discuss that later too. But we got to take this step by step. Yes, you're right, Lori. So it says that God blessed the seventh day, and He declared it holy. So that means that the seventh day was different. It was not the same as the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. No, the seventh day was different. It was special. And yes, it was so important, it was very important that we honor the Sabbath. It's important. And why? I'll tell you. We're going to go down those steps, but we'll get to that. It's very important. God declared it holy, meaning that it was very different. It was not the same as the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. The seventh was different. It's separate. says because it was the day when he rested from all of his work of creation. So now all of this says, you know, it's the point of the gospel really. It's the true point of the gospel. to the ultimate gospel which comes later thank you <laughs> it's connected to when it talks about Exodus when Moses gives the law he did not give the law to keep the Sabbath that was already there it was already established God established that already on the seventh day long time before it was not during the time of Moses when he was there and gave him the laws the tenth command the ten commandments kept the Sabbath was to keep the Sabbath holy, but it didn't start there. It started in the beginning when he established it on the seventh day. So it says, remember to observe, meaning to follow, not to just sit there and observe and watch, not to sit and watch something, but to follow this, to keep it the Sabbath day by doing what? Keeping it holy. And what that means of keeping it holy is to obey what God said. We obey what he says. So what are we supposed to do? Are we playing? Resting? What do you do? So on that day, you rest. There's no work. You can eat. You honor God. You go to church. And on that day, then the day after, you can go to work. So this does explain. It says you have six days each week for your ordinary work. Okay? It's 
really I feel a little bit guilty because I work on Sunday. So, you know, I want to honor the Lord and respect Him. But on Sundays, I have to work. So I'm going to explain that. You don't have to feel guilty. You do not have to feel guilty. I will explain that later. Just hold on to that for a minute. So the priest, the Pharisees, Pharisees, they worked on Sundays. They worked on the Sabbath day. They had to. They do, do like, prepare the animals for sacrifices and various things. So they had to work. That was work. But today, it's the same. You know, you have the firemen, the policemen, the doctors, nurses. They have to all have to work on Sunday. And me, yes, right? I have to work on Sunday. And I'll work. <laughs> yeah. So, so really, God's law is not, you know, just point blank, that's it. What this says is keep the Sabbath day holy, meaning obey. You know, you must rest, no work. But really, it's not just that's it and you must, you know, look to the new covenant. And it explains what that means. You know, you can't just accept this for what is the law and put it out there. You can't, you know, rest on the Sabbath day. And that's it. There's, I think it's you know, you have to obey their I'm sorry. <laughs> you can't work. <laughs> I thought I was voicing it wrong. <laughs> you have to rest on the seventh day. <laughs> I don't want anybody to take the bread and fall asleep. <laughs> the law is not by itself. No. You must look to the new covenant and look forward and say, oh, okay, so that's what this means. Okay, very important. So there's a lot of people today that say, oh, well, you must obey the law. You must keep the Sabbath on the seventh day. And if not, oh, man. But no, no, no. You have to look to the new covenant. So I'm going to explain, you know, what what do you do? The civil explain that. Hold on, hold on to that. <laughs> so, on the seventh day, it's Saturday, not Sunday. It's really on the Saturday. So now, there's some scriptures when the disciples went to church in the synagogue, the Jewish temple. It was on the first day of the week. And they changed it. Revelation, there's some scriptures in Revelation that say on the Lord's Day. And there's some scripture that seems to have changed it from Saturday to Sunday. This is the first day of the week. So you have to understand which is the seventh day. Or is it the seventh day or the first day of the week? Which is right. But really, you will believe that we keep the Sabbath really honor to honor Jesus Christ every day. We rest in Jesus every day. But that doesn't mean that we can work seven days a week. No. This is explains why. It says, but the seventh day is the Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. And on that day, no one in your household or family may do any work. And that includes you and your sons and your daughters, males, females, servants, your livestock, and any foreigners living among you. So it's including all. All of them must rest. And why? It's very interesting. There are people who come in and say, oh, that's against the law for resting. But why does it say? Why? That's what I want to know. For one reason, it's recently, like Lori said, you know, when you work, you know, for six days, your body needs rest. You know, to be healthy, your body must have rest. Now, some people work, you know, seven days a week because they're stuck. They have to work, like a farmer. You know, farmer has to go work, but, you know, they're off for a few hours, and they say, okay, well, they can find a way, and they can. 
but does that does not apply to us now? The Sabbath on the seventh day does not. But hold on to that thought. But the point of this is that God wants to show all of you that you need rest, and that points to resting in Christ. That's what it is. We rest in Christ, and that's important. And it prepares us to keep the Sabbath. We prepare until, the reason of being, it points to Jesus, that we rest in Christ and himself, and that's it. So this law here depends on two of the greatest commandments. Do you know which one they are? What are they? Love your neighbor as yourself. Love with all your soul, heart, and strength. And then what's the second? Love your neighbor. One of the Jewish leaders asked Jesus and said, What is the greatest commandment? And Jesus threw this out at him. And he replied, You must love your Lord, the Lord your God, with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is equally as important. Love your neighbor as yourself. That was it. And that's for us to follow today. There's no other command. Nope, no other commandments. The Jewish laws that were listed, like 639, no, nope, they're all set to the side. This is what we have to obey. One and two, that's it. All the laws in the Old Testament are gone. So now the point is, what is one word that you notice that is very important in the scripture? What? Love. So now, going back, we're talking about keeping the Sabbath day for the animals, for the family members, for all those, all people must rest. Do you know why? It's for love. Because we love them. <laughs> <laughs> So for all of the family members, all of the animals, it shows love. You don't tell them all to go work seven days a week, you know, tell them to get out and work. You know, if you imagine God commanding that there was no keeping the Sabbath holy, you know, the whole world, of course, you know, it's natural that it's round to be there. The boss would tell you to get to work. You have to work seven days a week. It would be. Seven days every week. You would never hear about rest. They would tell you, you're lazy. Get out there and work. Seven days a week. You need to work. And that would be hard. So, really, why does it say no rest? Might let them rest. Because of love. So in Matthew 22, 40, it says the entire law... And all of the demands of the prophets are all based on these two commandments. In other words, hang, I'm going to say depend, like if you or we obey the two laws, love your God and love your neighbor, you've already kept all the laws, and that's it. Everything else, it's fulfilled. It's fulfilled. That's what this says. You depend on these two commandments and you're finished. And the point is love. A long time ago, the law said that you must keep the Sabbath day of rest. It was really love. It was not to demand that, oh, you're going to be punished <laughs> if you don't rest. No. It wasn't like the law that was saying that it was for love. So if anyone says, oh, you didn't keep the Sabbath. Oh, you're awful. You're terrible. You didn't keep the Sabbath. Oh, God, I just didn't smite you. No, it's for love. You understand? I had one person tell me to say, oh, you have to keep the Sabbath day at risk. You know, for all these, and expounded on all these different reasons. And 
made a video of this whole list. <laughs> it was on Facebook, but I just dismissed it. Yeah, it was just recently. So just to be clear, it is love. Any discussion on that? And there's more. My point. So in Hebrews chapter 3, 11, there's a lot of scripture that I've taken about, you know, the Hebrews and their laws. And they would help the Christians who were struggling and being persecuted. And mostly there were younger people who were being persecuted for their faith. And some of them thought about quitting. And they say, no more, I can't continue as Christians. But then the book of Hebrews would help them. And they said, it's okay, it's all right, just going to warn you, you know, your faith in Jesus Christ, keep hold of it. You know, don't let your heart become hard. Just continue on. So they were giving them a warning, and it says, so in my anger, I took an oath that they will never enter my place of rest. Okay? So meaning, in the Old Testament, you'll remember people would travel, like, for 40 years. Like for just like first generation, they would travel for 40 years and they would go into the Canaan, which is the promised land. We you know why it's because they were rebelling, they didn't want to replace with God, they were repent, they were complaining, and they were against God. And they said, Oh, God is not with us. And their attitude, Moses told them their attitude stunk, they didn't believe in what Moses was trying to explain them that God keeps his promise and you'll be okay, come on and follow me. And they said, No, they continued to complain. You know, for example, one of the one of the leaders, the Pharaoh, the clan of Korah. Oh, Korah. Okay. Yeah. The clan of Korah. They punished them. The oath opened up, and they all fell in oh. and killed them all because they were all rebelling. So this is what they said. So for this generation, this first generation, people would travel for 40 years and they would go into the land of Canaan. None but all but two. Jonah. Joshua. Joshua and Caleb. And Caleb. That was the only two that went into the promised land. So this was talking about the Jewish people that were not allowed to go in. They had failed, so they didn't get to go into the promised land but they got to go into the place of rest. And really the point is, the picture is pointing to the new heaven. When you finally get to rest and you have that eternal rest. That's what that is. So really, the Sabbath is in Christ. We'll have successful rest there, eternal rest. But the picture in Canaan of the promised land is that picture that points to heaven. So, I'm trying to help myself understand the Sabbath better. So it doesn't say that you must have no work on the Sabbath, but to rest, the Sabbath is to rest and stop working for a few hours, and that gives us the practice, you know, to know that we need to rest our bodies, take the time to be able to continue and move on through the week, to do good works. The same picture as like when we're in heaven, we have to rest. Yeah, that's right. So that prepares, you know, God established that first. And he says, I rested, so you all will keep the Sabbath holy. Just as I did. And of course, that means all can rest on the Sabbath day, which is the seventh day. All of them. Even, you know, the Pharisees, you know, not everybody can rest on the Sabbath, but it's an encouragement to follow his law and say, you know, you do understand now what you need to do is trust in Jesus and you rest in Jesus Christ. You have rest in him. The law did not end itself. The law led us to Christ. Okay? And of course, all people follow this law. If it's true, Nobody. We all fail. We keep the first, second, 
the greatest commandments and love God and love your neighbor 100%. Do you keep that 100%? I don't. No. So just remember, you know, we discussed with someone, I discussed with someone who believed that you must keep the Sabbath. Must. Keep the Sabbath. All in your heart. 100%. In their heart, they believe that. So I asked, I said, do you love God with all your heart, 100%? You know what they said? Finish. You're challenging me. Quit. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> didn't like that. So obviously he was very proud, and he didn't like, you know, he didn't want to keep the law 100%. And I said, okay. I said, well, I don't. I don't know how to obey the law 100%. I don't. I fail. And his eyes got really big, and I was like, yeah, that's true. Because, you know, we're just Christians. Mm-hmm. So, the point is when you enter rest, when they entered the resting place of Canaan, it's like entering the same of rest, you know, points to Jesus Christ. So, Psalms 95, so I took this in the Old Testament, verses 10 through 11. It's the same, it says, For 40 years, I was angry with them, and I said, They are people whose hearts have turned away from me. They refuse to do what I tell them, so in my anger I took an oath, and they will never enter my place of rest. Okay? So this does not say you must keep the Sabbath. It doesn't say that. It just says that your hearts turned away from me. So the law itself helps people to do what God accepts? No. The law guides us to realize that we can't do these things and we need to do the right things in the right way and that's because God wants us to have a good heart. That's it. It's all about your heart. It's not about your works and obeying the law. It's about what's in your heart. God looks at your heart. So the point is that if you obey and keep turning away from God, your heart will turn away from him. That's what it's about. Not that you have to follow the law continuously, and if you broke the law, you're finished, that you failed, and not obey. It just means that if you don't obey the law and you keep ignoring it, that your heart will turn away from God. That's the point. Because our hearts are not, they don't have the desire to follow Him. So, yeah. So, we have to love, we have to want to follow Christ. And that will be in us, and that we will know to follow and do our best. Yes. We will want to be like Him. So, then we understand that what it's talking about, people in Israel. So going back to Hebrews, the next verse, 12 to 14, says, Be careful then, be careful, dear brothers and sisters, to make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving, turning away from the living God. You must warn each other every day so, we're Christians. We don't lose our salvation, right? We don't lose our salvation, but this says to be careful that our hearts will become evil and turn away. Be careful? What does that mean? Well, what that means is that each one of us are responsible for making sure that we are Christians. To make sure that we continue to have faith. Continue in faith and do not stray. It's a reminder. And that's because there are some people who seem to have really, they're strong Christians, they're faithful, they're knowledgeable about the Bible, and then, pow, they're gone. They're same as atheists. They're blind. They don't believe God. They're sinners. Their hearts become hard. And that means that they were never saved to begin with. For example, I remember a long time ago when the Jewish people, they had very strong religion, but they were not truly Abraham's children. They're truly, they had Jewish hearts, spiritual children of Abraham, but not them. 
Oh, yeah. They had the blood of Abraham, but they were not spiritually Israel. Spiritual Israel. Manual. God's word. Manual. Was the right thing. And they had faith in God. Okay. They're right alongside of it, parallel, but then they just strayed. They were not in line with faith in Jesus Christ to save them. They trusted God, provided He provided salvation to He alone. Because if people believed they owed, obeyed the law, they would stay with them, but they were not with God. God was not with them. They were not related. There was nothing. There was no religion there. They just labeled themselves as Christians. Remember what I said, nominal Christians? It just means that you label yourself as Christian, but you're not truly saved. There's nothing there. You could be going along with it, you would just stray off. But those who are truly trusting in Jesus Christ, saved for salvation, they have guilt in their sin, they trust that Jesus loves us, you love the Lord, you go to church, you support your brothers and sisters in Christ, and your heart is really truly changed. And you're in line and you depend on Christ. You're right in line with him and you're resting on Jesus Christ. But those who are beside him, are they resting? No, they're trying to do everything themselves. They never stop working. They never have rest. And then they stray off. It looks like they're, you know, finished. They're, they have no religion. They have no sin. Some of them say that. I don't sin. I have no sin. Uh, that's a lie. <laughs> They're a hypocrite. Okay. So it's warning you all. You, all you Christians, we're good. You believe in Jesus Christ, that's really good, but you have to continue with your faith. Those of you who have an end to your faith, it warns you. If a person strays in their sin, are you saved? Why are you doing this? You're sinning. Kind of warn them and nudge them and say, don't let your heart become hard. So that's what that means. It's a warning. Does that mean that we can lose our salvation? No. There are many scriptures that explain that we do not lose our salvation. Romans chapter 8, going down. We are never separate from the love of God. Nothing. A higher, lower power, nothing can separate us from the love of God. It's our responsibility and our reminder that we have to be aware of our hearts because it can become weak and stray. You know, you know we, our minds are weak. So we have to really keep ourselves and our friends. You know, hey, are you sure? You know, remind each other. That's right. So there's more. Hebrews 12, 14 says, Today, go back, it says, You must warn each other every day while it is still today. And that means that that's his promise. It's there. You go rest. We rest in Christ. That's his promise. So today, it still stands. And obviously, those who maybe think, Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian really they're not truly saved and then they realize oh no I thought I was saved oh, I feel guilty I'm in sin I need to rest in Christ and they become saved so it says today it's still a promise it's still there today so that's obvious it's very clear there are, there are some who think they're Christians but there are not but they are not so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. So it's very clear. So if you're preaching the gospel and you say, oh, I'm saved. And then you understand in your heart and your head that you're not saved. And say, oh, as the promise is still standing, they can receive Christ. So it's very clear. We don't lose our salvation. For if we are faithful to the end, until Jesus comes, and we're still standing and we're all resurrected. So if we're still faithful to the end, trusting God just as firmly as when we first believed. So there you go. It's clear. So when we first believe and we continue on, we're resting in Christ until the very end. 
you're saying that you go up. Wow. That's a strong warning, right? It is a warning. Not pointing to those who follow the law, not saying, oh, do you rest? Do you follow the law? Have you been circumcised? Okay. No. It's pointing to Christ. You're resting in Christ. And that's the answer to your salvation, not the law. It doesn't depend on the law that says you must keep the Sabbath holy. That's the law that leads you to know the right way. And the right way, you realize you broke the law, and the law leads you to Christ. That's the whole story. It's not the whole story. You can't just stop with the Old Testament laws that are right there. No, you have to look forward, and it makes sense. It leads you to the New Testament. So then it says, we will share in all. So when and trusting God just as firmly as we first believed. It points to Christ. We will share in all that belongs to Christ. Christ is the center. It's the whole Bible is about him, Jesus. Then in the end, chapter 4, Hebrews 1 through 2, it says, God's promise of entering his rest still stands. It's still there. So, we ought to tremble with fear that some of you might might fail to experience it. So that's a warning saying maybe some of you are religious people, maybe you're religious, but you're not really a Christian. You haven't gone into rest in Christ yet. And that's a warning. Strong warning. So some of you might fail to experience it. So this is good news. So why is it good news? Because it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Or this is good news that God has prepared this rest He's already prepared how? Through the law, keeping the Sabbath, and then it points later. He's already prepared it from the very beginning. So he's finished, and he has been announced to us just as it was to them, being the people of Israel. So the people of Israel, they were clueless. They didn't know, you know that God had provided salvation. They didn't know this yet, but they knew. They were rebelling. They were very rebellious. They knew the gospel, but they didn't truly understand how God would provide salvation through Jesus Christ on the cross yet. But they knew that it was only God that provides salvation, you know, not through obeying the law. Only God can provide salvation himself. They knew that. That was the good news, and they knew. Since it has been announced to us just as it was to them. So it's the same. They knew. They were not innocent. They couldn't say that they didn't know. It's not true. They already knew. If you remember, Jesus sat explains that we were born again and we know and we see God's kingdom and he is in control. He is sovereign over my life. It's spiritual. It's not talking about heaven. Those who were born can see his kingdom now. They can see God's kingdom is in control of their life. Okay, so then Hebrews 4, 10, 11 says, For all who have entered into God's rest have rested from their labors. Trying to do all their work followed the law. Just as God did after, there it is, relating to the first, the very beginning in Genesis, chapter 2, in that verse, in verse 2, 2 and 3, just as God did after creating the world. So it's referring all the way back, this point to the gospel. So let us do our best to enter that rest. Meaning, do our best, does that mean that we have to work really hard? No, it just means that we need to realize that we're sinners and understand that what we need to do you know, explain to me more what you need to me to repent stop sinning I don't want to sin anymore I want to trust in Jesus Christ and that's the work that you enter into rest not obeying the law meaning that you have to do everything that you can 
Just realize that you can't save yourself. There's nothing that you can do to save yourself. And you realize that it's all up to Jesus Christ. That's what that means. All of us can enter into rest. doesn't mean that you obey the law. <laughs> so just as God, so let us do our best to enter that rest. But if we disobey God as the people of Israel did, then we fail. So the point is, meaning that we complain and rebel against God and sin and refuse to trust in God and provide salvation? No. We fail. That's the gospel. Point to the gospel, not the point of being under the law and obeying everything and keeping the Sabbath holy. And you know, that's the end of itself. That's not it. All it's doing is relating to Christ, to rest in Christ. Okay. Ooh, we're in a town. Okay. So I just want to ask you, who gives us rest? Who gave us rest? Jesus. Do you have a scripture to prove it? What's the verse? <laughs> There's another scripture there. Matthew chapter 11, 28 through 30. And Jesus said, Come to me, all who you are weary and carry a heavy burden. Like all that he was talking to the Pharisees. And then they talk about the, the commandments, making up the commandments. Come to me, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and I will teach you. I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. So why? Because Jesus is supporting you, makes everything light. With Jesus, we can rest in him. That's the answer. Not to obeying the law, doing the works. Some say you must con obey the law and keep the Sabbath holy, they've missed the point. So, relating back, it's clear. When God finished work, he rested. At that point to the people of Israel, resting in Christ. Amen? So in the Old Testament, it says, keep the seventh day, and under the New Covenant, it seems that we rest in Christ every day. And then some say, oh no, it's still the seventh. You just change the first day of the week. Yeah. There's some scriptures that mention the Lord's Day on Sunday. There are. There's a few there. But it's changed from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. There is a change. But there are some who don't like to hear the word changed. But it does have in Hebrews, it says it's there. It does say a change. There's a few scriptures that say that. that explain about keeping the Sabbath holy and what they mean, that you established that yourself for rest on the seventh day. That was you. And it opened up to us to understand that we need rest in Christ under the new covenant. In Jesus' name, amen.